Choose Linux, episode 28, for February 6th, 2020. Hello and welcome to the show. I'm Joe. I'm Drew. And I'm Mel. And here we are for episode 28. And Valentine's is just around the corner. So we thought we'd talk about what we love about Linux. It's the season of love and everything. But also a few things that we wish were better. So Elle, what's the first thing that you love about Linux? Well, you guys know that I don't tend to make a lot of mistakes when it comes to my desktop. You know, I really <laughs> like stability. And, you know, I like things just to work. So I, I tend to not to mess with them. But in all reality, the thing I love most about Linux is how simple it is just to start over. Like, you guys have heard me use the term rekick, and I do that all of the time. And it's not a difficult process. Um, all right, moment of vulnerability here. I spent maybe... 48 hours attempting to learn how to burn a Windows like boot disk so that I could give WSL a try. It's not that complicated when it comes to Linux. In fact, there are tons of just free software programs that you can use just to click a few buttons and you've got whatever distro you want. So that is the first thing I love about Linux. Well, very quick pro tip. If you've got another Windows machine, then there's a, a program called Rufus, which is open source, which you can use to put uh, images onto a USB stick. So I recommend that. I don't know how to do it from Linux. I think there is a way, but I'm not sure. I'm not going to go out and buy a Windows machine just to get Windows. <laughs> <laughs> you can borrow one from a friend or whatever. But, uh, hey, bro, can I borrow some Windows, please? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, here's a tip for you. You can load up a virtual machine, put Windows on it, and then you can use is either Rufus or you can just download the official Microsoft, you know, update roll-up pack thing that will create a USB stick for you, do that through USB redirection, and then use that on the computer that you're trying to do it on bare metal. So let me say again what I love about Linux. I love the simplicity. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, it is so easy to install on a new machine. When I got this desktop, I installed Zubuntu in about five minutes on it and then copied my config files from my NAS and I was going in like 10, 15 minutes tops and I was just totally back how I was on my previous machine. That is definitely one of the, the good things. And also being able to run live. I did that for some data rescue the other day, just booted up a, a live Zubuntu. That takes less than a minute to boot and you've got this full operating system just running off a USB stick. That reminds me of something that you recently taught me, and it's that I don't always have to re-kick. You taught me how to actually make a recovery USB that I could go on and fix whatever configuration files I might have, you know, left a white space on or whatever. Um, so with in that line, I don't know if you could do that in Windows. Just like, oh, let me just go and put this in and fix one typo and I'm back and running. Like that just doesn't sound like something that could occur. Well, there's been times back in the day when I'd try and tweak my registry and then it just wouldn't boot and it's like, uh, well, I could try and fix it or I could just go through the reinstall process. But with Linux, everything is generally in a plain text file. So you're right, it is much easier. I'm sure people who know about Windows would would probably argue with me and say that it's it's simple, but it surely can't be as simple as Linux. Having done support for Windows machines and using the modern rescue tools, it's still not that easy. I mean, you've got to get to terms with working with, you know, registry hives and booting into CLIs where the commands are nowhere near as robust as they are on, you know, Linux. I no, I, I would say, in my opinion, definitively, it's way easier to fix a Linux machine than it is to fix a Windows machine, depending on the level of how screwed up it is, of course. So it's funny, Drew, for your first thing that you love about Linux is also something that you think could use improvement. Yeah, absolutely. And that's standardization. I think that in a lot of ways, Linux has really great standardization with being able to reuse common libraries between applications so that you don't have to recreate the wheel. And then you have things like free desktop specifications and things even like general keystrokes where so many applications will just accept Vim key bindings. But 
there's a flip side to that where there are things that just decide, oh, you know what? I don't like the standard, so I'm going to make a new one. Things like you know, client-side decorations not working properly across different desktop environments or where we have competing standards, you know, Snap versus Flatpak, which you know, harkens back to the old Betamax versus VHS fights. And I'm not trying to say that, you know, we shouldn't have multiple things, but sometimes it is a little frustrating where, you know, distro X is supporting one, but distro Y is supporting the other and leads to some growing pains. So I do feel like it's a double-edged sword. You say the standard keystrokes and key bindings, but even stuff like if you're trying to do a recursive flag, sometimes that's capital R, sometimes it's not a capital I feel like there's not as much standardization as you claim somehow. Well, I think it depends on what area you're looking at. Sure, command flags and things like that, it's always up to the individual programmer as to what they're going to implement. But that's not to say that there's not some generally accepted things like design language as shown in elementary's desktop or human interface guidelines, those sorts of things. So I think it just depends on where you're looking. You know, not going as deep as you guys did down to the libraries and everything, but if you look at just standardization across Linux distributions as a whole, I think that they've done an amazing job of making it so if I'm using Ubuntu on the desktop, I could easily jump to CentOS or Elementary or something just becomes native about it and you can continue to use it regardless of what you're on until you get down to the nitty gritty. Yeah, I suppose if you're going to jump from an Ubuntu-based system to Red Hat-based one, you're going to have to change package manager. But ultimately, it's not going to be hugely different. Most of what you're doing in a terminal is going to be the same. And if you're using a GUI, then whether it's GNOME on Fedora, say, or GNOME on Ubuntu, yeah, there's small differences, but it is ultimately a fairly similar and transferable experience. I think we have to be honest. Those of us that would notice the difference are going to end up finding a way to make it happen anyways. Like, I still end up using Yum 90% of the time. And how long has that been deprecated? (laughs) Well, if you're stuck on an old enough CentOS box, then you have to use Yum. You know, it's not even being on an older box. That's what I'm saying. We are all so set in our ways that we've just aliased Yum to DNF. (laughs) I still use apt-get, even though you don't need to anymore. Who's using aptitude now? (laughs) (laughs) Certainly not me. I'm apt all the way. Well, that kind of ties in with the thing that I love about Linux, and that's the flexibility. That's that you can take an Ubuntu base and you can put XFC on it or you can put GNOME on it and you can use a different shell like Fish or you could use something like Regolith, which is an i3 based desktop on top of Ubuntu. And you can do the same with pretty much any distro and any combination of software. If you're willing to work hard enough, you can make it exactly how you want it. And that flexibility, you just don't get with other operating systems. Not only that, you don't get the diversity either, because those other operating systems typically don't have things like alternative desktop environments. And we've got just a plethora. As much as I can appreciate the flexibility that there is, I kind of go on the other end of it as much as I appreciate that you don't have to use the flexibility. Like, I don't have to go in and configure everything from the bottom up just the way I want it. I can just download the one that I like. Like, you all know that I am a GNOME user. So I will just download that one, and that's what I'll use. And I can be happy with that, and I can recommend it to others without saying, okay, here are the 15 steps you need to take just to get up and running. Oh, sure. And, you know, defaults are king in a lot of ways. And one nice thing is that we have so many different distros and pseudo distros where it's literally just repackaged Ubuntu, where the defaults are closer to what you might want. That is something of a double-edged sword, though, because it means there's a lot of fragmentation. And so it's harder for developers to target just one operating system. But I think that that flexibility is worth the fragmentation because it means that I can make it exactly how I want it and so can anyone else. And, you know, even though it feeds into my last dislike of lack of standardization, I do agree with you that we are better off for having something of a quote-unquote fragmented ecosystem just because it means there are more people out there trying more different things that could lead to something great. 
anytime that I see somebody throwing something at the wall to see what sticks, you know, I, I tend to applaud them. I think it's good to reach out and experiment and try new things because if we don't, then we stagnate. But that same flexibility that allows you to pick the software stack that you want, whether it's on a server or on the desktop, means that Linux can work on a Raspberry Pi all the way up to a supercomputer. And there's always some version of Linux and some combination of all that open source software that will be suited to whatever computer you're using. And you can't really say that for many other operating systems. I think we've encountered that a few times when we were talking about salvaging, you know, the older hardware or me buying that laptop that was just greatly underpowered where I was ready just to chunk it and be like, you know what, this isn't worth my time. But people are like, oh, have you tried this distro? Have you tried this? I don't know. It just it keeps curiosity going instead of just calling it quits. Well, and you can even go so far as to have specialist things like building a synthesizer out of a Raspberry Pi or making it into something like a Pi hole, where it's a single use computer that you're not going to log into and actually do work on, but maybe it's a toy, maybe it's a key piece of your network infrastructure. There's a lot that can be done that you simply can't with things like Windows or Mac OS. Yeah, you can even make yourself a white noise machine like I have with a Raspberry Pi Zero. It's not connected to the network. It doesn't need to be. All it needs to do is turn on every night and turn off every morning. And it plays the nice Star Trek bridge sound and uh, helps me drift off to sleep and stay asleep while I am there. And yeah, I just can't imagine that I would do that with a Windows machine because it'd just be using too much power. Whereas this thing, it barely uses any power at all. So I don't worry at all about that aspect. I wonder if you could connect a Raspberry Pi Zero to a potato. (laughs) I don't think you get quite enough from a potato. (laughs) Maybe if you had a whole sack of them. Well, now I know what I'm doing on Saturday. (laughs) (laughs) Elle, you love that it makes you feel like a hacker. I do. There are times when... Okay, guys, don't judge me. Okay, go ahead and judge me, but it's still fun. Um... (laughs) When I'm just I'm, I'm on the command line and I am just determined that I am going to get something to work. And I mean, we're talking, I'm wearing the hoodie. I've got the hood up with the headphones on because I want people to leave me alone because I'm going to make this work. And I kind of get to a point where I want to stop and I took the headphones off and I see people just kind of looking, trying to see what I'm doing on my screen, especially at places like an airport. And you just feel like really empowered and impressive in that moment. <laughs> I think you're right, actually. Um, when I um, have to support people who I've set up on Linux, and you know they've never ever opened the terminal, and then I open it and type a few things, and then there's all this scrolling text, and they're like, "Whoa, what are you doing?" And they're trying to kind of see what I'm doing, and I'm like, "Don't worry about it. Don't worry about it." And then I just <laughs> fix their problem. There is a certain um, there's a kind of feeling of superiority, I suppose. Well, yeah. And back when I used to have to go in and like do network analysis and and measure Wi-Fi across buildings and stuff, and I would boot up a terminal and load up a terminal Wi-Fi analysis kit and walk around with it. And it's got these little bars and end curses displays and things. And people are looking at me like, wow, that guy is really doing something cool. It really does feel good. It's funny. Oh, maybe maybe I'm the only one. So you guys tell me. But I also feel a kind of a sense of ownership of my terminal. Like, fine, you can come on my computer. You can use Firefox. Don't touch my terminal. Well, yeah, it doesn't have their name in the PS1, does it? <laughs> and it's not just the kind of look and feel of the terminal. The, the fact that we have such a great terminal that, as I said, you can have different shells in It is so powerful, and you don't necessarily have to use it, but if you want to use it, it gives you so much power of your machine that, okay, yes, you do have a terminal on a Mac, and you do, um, there's actually now the open source terminal on Windows, but we've had this for so long, and it feels to me like a fundamental part of Linux, and anyone who's getting into it seriously, I would always suggest that they learn a little bit about it. Not that you have to, but if you really want to learn about the system, it's it's such a gateway to just everything that you can do with a computer. Absolutely. Well, and if we're going to really get into it, we've also got things like shell scripts where you can use pipes and different utilities to create 
mini applications that you can use to like rename a whole bunch of files or search in a bunch of files and replace text. Things that would take a normal person operating in like Microsoft Word or whatever hours upon hours to do, you can do with a simple shell script running set across a whole directory. It's amazing. So here's a fun thing that I've done with my kids. I, I've been trying to teach them a little bit of Linux, and I give them like little bits of homework. And I'll go into their system and create hidden files that just say things like, you know, your mom thinks you're amazing, or don't forget you're a BA. Can I, I don't want to cuss, but I'll tell them that they're amazing. <laughs> <laughs> and I know that sounds so silly, like, okay, why does that make the terminal amazing? But to me, it, just being able to create that hidden file, that Easter egg, you know, things like being able to use fish to add color to my screen just kind of makes me and I feel other people want to continue that journey. It keeps the spark alive. That's adorable. I love that. <laughs> But one thing that I wish was better is software availability. I love all the open source stuff that I have access to, but just sometimes there's that one bit of proprietary software. And especially when I'm trying to convert someone to Linux or at least tell them what's great about it, and they say, oh, right, yeah, so can I get Photoshop? And you're like, well, no, but you can get uh, GIMP, which is kind of as good. But, you know, the, just that lack of software which holds me back from really telling people that they should come over to join us on the Linux side. That's been one of my biggest gripes, too. Um, I have had my time where I got to use a Mac, and whenever I would go to the App Store on the Mac, I knew that what I was pulling down, I was going to be able to use. We've run into it a few times here where I pull software down from, you know, one of the software stores for Linux, and it's four generations behind. Or it's there, but then I go look at the documentation and the project isn't supported anymore. Even that when we have community contributions where it's available through GitHub, I'll get really excited. Like, this is exactly what I needed to do. Last push, 1999. Well, wait a minute. <laughs> <laughs> but then you do have things like Snaps and Flatpak, which are helping with that issue. And we're getting more and more of the commercial proprietary software available to us, whether you actually want to use that obviously is up to the individual, but it, we're slowly getting there with things like Spotify and, and whatnot and Slack. But I think we do have a way to go on that. And and you're right, with these older bits of software that have been abandoned that are still available, I mean, some of them are still useful, but it can be very frustrating when you're several versions behind and there's no Snap or PPA available. I do think it's getting better, but yeah, you're right. There is a long ways to go. Now, I am finally at a point where I barely need Windows for anything, but there are still just one or two things that I can't do on Linux that I really do need some proprietary software for. Granted, one of them is gaming. Yeah, I was going to say, uh, good luck playing multiplayer Rocket League in the future. Oh, yeah. Well, that's not a game that I ever personally played, but that is a big one, and it was a shame to hear about, that's for sure. I think probably the thing that I love the most about Linux is security, and that's what drove me over to Linux in the first place. Knowing that it's open source, knowing that anyone could look at the code, okay, it doesn't make it perfectly secure because bugs do get found and security holes, but I feel much safer using Linux if I want to do banking or anything that I feel is really, really serious. And I don't feel comfortable doing that on a non-open source operating system. Yeah, I tend to agree with you there, Joe. Not only can we audit these things and really see what's in them and make sure that they work properly, like for example, WireGuard in the kernel has been undergoing extensive audits just to get it mainlined. That's something that I really appreciate about having such a transparent process and such an open ecosystem is I can actually feel like I can trust this stuff. And yeah, I would never do banking on a Windows computer or something where I feel like I could be tracked or somehow spied on because it's just not safe. Well, it's not that it's not safe, right? It's that we just don't know. It could be perfectly safe to use a Windows machine or a Mac. But because those operating systems are proprietary, we just don't know. Oh, man, this one is so hard for me to 
speak on. And that's because the more that I learn, the more that I've learned that I don't know enough to give a concrete answer. Like This is so hard because I want to say yes, because I can see the code, because I can examine it, and because I can have control. This is more secure. But how often do I expect a code? How often do I go down and look at the libraries? How often would I know if one of the repos was hacked and something else was put into its place, which happened, that I pulled something that I wasn't supposed to? The fact is that very few of us actually do that. And when it comes to if I'm going to put a family member or somebody on a machine, honestly, if they're doing something like banking, I'm probably going to put them on a Mac because at least I know that their updates are happening. Like, it, oh, it's such a Pandora's box when it comes to which operating system is more secure. Because in the end, it just depends who you've pissed off. Somebody can get into your operating system regardless of what you're using. Well, yeah, that is true that, you know, given the time and the inclination, somebody with enough skill can get into just about anything. But I do feel better being on an operating system where at least I know that I can look at what's under the hood. Even if I don't audit the code myself, I do see that people who know what they're doing are auditing it in some cases. Not everything is being audited, of course, but if it's in the Ubuntu main repos, for example, I feel pretty secure that that code has at least been looked at. Yeah, and I feel pretty confident in Canonical's ability to secure those repos and not have them compromised. And same with other major distros as well, like SUSE or Red Hat. The next dislike it might be just a personal one because maybe I just haven't gone far deep enough into the rabbit hole to find the solution. But when my brother was taking care of my mom's computer, all he would do is RDP into it, teach her, hey, mom, click here, do this, do that. I haven't found a comparable solution on Linux. So when I have to do it, I have to get in my car, drive six hours down to see her to teach her how to poke the buttons. So I have to say that I really do wish we had something like RDP on the Linux distributions I've been using. Aha, we can fix this one. Teach me, oh Drew, teach me. <laughs> <laughs> well, first, there's things like TeamViewer or Chrome Remote Desktop, which are pretty easy to get going and available for most major distros so long as they're, you know, at least Debian or RPM based for TeamViewer and Chrome, so long as you can install Chrome, it yeah, you can get it working there. Firefox, Drew. Firefox. <laughs> <laughs> But then you also have some options where if you don't need to directly control it, but you need to walk her through it, you can just use something as simple as, you know, meet.jit.c. But isn't this just finding proprietary solutions when we're sitting here trying to talk about open source and Linux? Well, not necessarily because Jitsi is open source. So if you use Jitsi Meet and you don't need to actively control her screen, you are still on open source software. And maybe it's getting into the nitty gritty, but, you know, it's one of those, like you said, we can find tools that can kind of be similar, but not as good. It's the whole Photoshop thing, because, yeah, I want to control her screen. I don't want to go, Mom, a little to the left. No, not that left. The other left. Mom, right. no, not. <laughs> <laughs> well, and to be fair, we do have VNC, which is a little bit more of a pain to set up, but it is very flexible and it works very well. It's just not quite as fast or as slick as RDP, but it does work. So if you can get VNC, like Tiger VNC or something running on her computer and have a port open for you in her firewall, which, you know, of course, you'll want to secure that with a password, it's doable. Well, I will have to look into that and maybe we can report back on another episode. Well, something that I'm sure we've all experienced is running into problems and having to find creative solutions. And that's something that you love about Linux, Drew. Yeah, this is probably my favorite thing about Linux altogether, is it always makes my brain turn. Anytime that I come up with some kind of issue, I have to try and learn something to fix it. Like just today, we had a regolith update, and I wanted to go from the old edition to the new edition. Well, there were some breaking changes in the config files, so I had to relearn how to do those config files and ended up teaching myself about how it's using the include structure just to get it back up and running with my theme, my customizations, and all of that on top of it. 
And this applies not just to things like theming, but all the way down to, well, my Wi-Fi is not working, so let's figure out how to run a cable from one laptop to another and reroute the network signal like you had to do recently, Joe. Yeah, which I did find fun in a weird way. And I mentioned my white noise machine. That was actually incredibly hard to make work because I had the script that would generate the noise, but it would only output out of HDMI. No matter how I tried, I tried a system D unit and it just wouldn't work. And so I had to come up with a creative solution, which was install XFCE and then use application auto start through the GUI to get it working. And somehow that managed to push the noise out through the USB speaker that I wanted. And I'm sure there's probably another way that I could have done it. But in the end, I did solve the problem. And there's a real sense of satisfaction when you solve that problem, whether it is on a server or just a little box like this. You will always run into problems with any sort of computer system. And yeah, there are various solutions that you can come up with on any operating system. But there's something about Linux and there always being three or four ways to do it and the immense satisfaction when you get it working. Yeah, it really gets my endorphins going when I finally click the button and it works. It is such a great feeling that I haven't been able to replicate with any other operating system just based on the fact that Linux feels so much more natural to me. And I don't know why that is. It just is. I think I have to completely agree with you guys on this one. And I know that on Choose Linux, I end up sounding like a pessimist because I'm always pointing out what's wrong, what didn't happen. I don't mean to be a pessimist. I think I just want to bring it up so we can cause change. But the fact that I am sticking with it should tell you guys that I believe in it because there is nothing more exciting than when I've struggled for a week with a distro hop and then I get it to work and then I get the updates to work and then I'm actually running it for a week or more. And I think you guys have seen it where I'm blowing up our our messaging going like, look what I did. Oh my God, look. And then there's pictures and there's screenshots and it's a sense of empowerment. I can't remember what distro it was, but I remember you being so proud that you'd printed out your notes for the the one we were talking about. I I would actually have to go look because they're actually pinned to my board in my office going, I did that. (laughs) I got the printer to work on Linux. And, you know, I think it speaks to the passion that a lot of us have for free and open source software and Linux and the developers and all of the people who are involved. It really is something, isn't it? And not to do a shameless message here, but can I just take a moment and say thank you to all of those developers? Thank you for putting up with all the criticism and all the bad things that I've said and still doing what you're doing and making this better for us. Yeah, I should probably apologize to the GNOME developers for some of the things I've said (laughs) over the years. (laughs) Well, time gets the better of us, so we better wrap it up. Remember, you can go to choose slash subscribe for all the ways to get future episodes and choose linux.show slash contact for ways to get in touch with us. And you can find us all on Twitter. I'm at Drew of Doom. And I'm at L underscore O underscore punk at L O punk. And I'm at Joe Rissington. We'll be back in two weeks. Bye.